Welcome to another show of the Research to Reps Roundtable. I'm your co-host, Pat Ivey, and with me are... Co-host, Ted Lambernitas. Yes. Hey, hey, and Javar Gillette here. How are y'all doing? Good. Yes, sir. Hey, how's it going? How's it going? What do you have for us, coach? So, so Pat, we got a great guest today. Uh, this is a jack of all trades, a, a genius in our field, um, in my mind, and a godsend to me and, and my work uh, while I've been with the Houston Rockets and, and as we continue um, in a new role here with the Minnesota Timberwolves. But John DeWitt uh, is, is a, a, who I now consider a, a close friend and a colleague. Um, when I say jack of all trades in, in our field, he can do it all. He's been um, in the weight room uh, working with athletes. He's been in the weight room working um, uh, in, in soccer. And he's uh, for a long time been in the weight room working uh, with astronauts. So he, he worked with NASA for a long time. I'll let him just kind of tell you a little bit about that. But um, aside from that, uh, he's also done a lot of work with me in basketball. Uh, and and uh, I can't tell you uh, how valuable uh, a person is that not only knows the weight room, but can also uh, do the science. And, and from a from a, a biomechanist standpoint uh, to an exercise physiologist standpoint, um, he can do it all. Um, so he's my unicorn, uh, John DeWitt. So welcome, John. <laughs> welcome, John. Thanks, Javar. I'm not really quite sure how to follow up that introduction. <laughs> very humbling and very, uh, very nice of you to, to uh, speak of me that way. And I, I also think of you, Javar, as a close friend. Um, so uh, I'll just, Pat, I'll just give you a, just a really brief overview of my background. Um, uh, so uh, Javar may have made me sound a little bit more impressive than I really am, but I just want to make set the record straight. So I am, I currently um, do a couple things. So I, my, I have a full-time job with the Chicago Cubs as their senior biomechanist. Um, I was, uh, uh, took the position last fe uh, February, right before COVID. Um, so I've been, <laughs> Uh, I've had a very strange baseball year, you could say. Um, and prior to that, I was the senior biomechanist at NASA Johnson Space Center, where I worked in the exercise physiology laboratory, and then also for the crew health and performance um, division, where essentially I did a, a combination of biomechanics uh, of exercise as it applies to astronauts. I've had a lucky enough to, to be the PI of an experiment on treadmill running up on the International Space Station. And um, I was, I've also been heavily involved in the, the design of exercise devices as, as you guys probably know when you go up to space, because there's no gravity, you, you have to change the way you exercise, but you still want to apply the loads that you would get during normal ground-based exercise on the body. So you have to design your devices a little bit different since you lose your body weight. Um, and so, so in my back, my background, I actually have an engineering, a couple engineering degrees from when I was an undergrad way back in the, in the early eighties. And it was at that time when I decided I don't want to be an engineer. I want to be something that has to do with sports. Uh, biomechanics wasn't really um, a possibility in the mainstream, but there were some places that had biomechanics uh, programs. So I, I went to Arizona State where I got my, my, my master's in biomechanics and that's how I blended the engineering and the, and, the, and the science and the sports and the exercise. So when I was at NASA, I would like kind of sit between the engineers and the, the strength and conditioning folks and make sure that the devices that were designed, the engineers were following some sort of technical um, instructions and you have to build the device to do this and that and this, that they actually made a device that someone could actually exercise on because sometimes you would end up with some devices that they met all requirements, but they weren't good for exercise. So um, I did that, but I really, I, I always uh, had a, a, a love of sports. I was actually the head women's soccer coach at the University of New Mexico way back in the, in the late nineties. So I, I've coached at division one level it was after that when I moved to NASA. And during the time when I was at NASA, I started to, to cultivate some relationships with um, some people in professional and college sports. So I've done some sports science consulting for the University of Michigan football team. Um, <clears throat> did it, as Javar said, with the Houston Rockets. Uh, 
I do a little work with him now with the with uh, his uh, job at Minnesota. I've also done work um, with uh, some of the professional soccer teams in, in Europe. Um, and I guess the only thing I left out, obviously, I said I coach soccer. For a long time, I worked with the Houston Dynamo and Houston Dash. And then um, I was on the field as a physical uh, coach, uh, soccer coach and their fitness coach. And then I also worked with their data. And then I've had some brief stints uh, as the assistant coach on the Trinidad and Tobago women's national soccer team and then on the Afghanistan women's national soccer team. So I've kind of had myself bouncing around all over the place. Today was one of those days I felt like by, by coincidence that everything was culminating because I was doing a little bit of work for, for doing stuff for my work with the Cubs. And then I get a call from someone from or an email actually from the space station from one of the astronauts who wanted a, wants a soccer ball and a, and a Jersey sent up so she can wear it during some sort of public, um, probably some sort of PA uh, thing that's going to happen a public appearance. And, they, they emailed me and said, hey, can you help us? And I made my two phone calls to the coaches of the, of the Dash. And now there's a ball and a jersey being sent up to the space station. So I kind of tied it all together today. And it's been fun. Can't get the U.S. mail to work, but we can get the mail up to the U.S. space station. <laughs> I don't know. We've got, we've got the ball and the jersey on its way from downtown Houston to Johnson Space Center. The getting it up to this international space and that's someone else's job. So we'll, <laughs> that's awesome. Super impressive. Super. I was just wondering, what do you want to do when you grow up? <laughs> <laughs> kind of doing it now, maybe take a rest. <laughs> <laughs> right. Wow. Impressive. It sounds like um, you were the person that helped to build the $6 million man. Yeah, I guess, uh, Right now, it's the six billion dollar man, though, because that, that's <laughs> inflation from back in the seventies, right? <laughs> awesome. So, uh, what is it like working remotely and being a biomechanist mechanist? Um, how does that work? So, uh, most of the jobs or, or, or work that I do has to do with di analyzing data. Um, it, it could be a long-term project like research into a, a research question like we might ask in the laboratory, or it could be a short-term project of, you know, from, a, from a, uh, a movement perspective, hey, we noticed something in this guy yesterday, can you take a look? And as long as the data are collected and they're available online, I mean, you have access to everything that you need. So to me, it's, it's very seamless, especially in this day and age with Slack and, you know, Zoom and all those sort of things. Um, I'm able to, as long as I can get access to the data and then I can do whatever I need to do analysis wise, it's pretty seamless uh, to do this. And if you think about it, when I was doing my work at NASA, I was kind of working remotely anyway, because I don't know why, but they wouldn't let me go up to the space station to conduct my experiments. They made me stay on the ground. <laughs> so I had to take the data from there and, and analyze it anyway. So I'm very used to this sort of thing. I'm just joking that they wouldn't let me go up because I'm not an astronaut. <laughs> hey, John, in terms of the data you'd analyze yeah, with the Cubs, how's the, uh, the, uh, the chain of communication go? So you analyze the data, do you talk to the specific coach before he talks to the player or do you go directly talking to the coach and the player at one time? Yeah, well, I've only remember I've only been there for uh, less than a year, and I was in it was a new position when I came in, so we're still and and we've had a weird year, of course. So we're trying to figure out uh, all those sort of things. But right now, I don't talk to any players. I talk to either uh, I don't I don't even talk to the to the uh, head coaches. I'll talk to there's a, you know there's a staff of development coaches and there's a staff of of guys that kind of sit between the coaches and the R&D department. So, and I sit in the R&D department. So I'll talk to those guys um, who will then filter that information to whoever it needs to go to. And, and that's, from a data analyst standpoint, I guess, I think the first question is, you, you came from sport and you had a lot of experiences with sport. So what got you into the code writing and, and tell us a little bit more about that and how you think we as strength coaches can 
uh, you know, what should we think about that? Is it important? Um, is it needed? Is it something that will help us in our field in the future? Yeah, that's a great question, Javar. I, um, you know, the reason I got into to the coding in the first place is is one of my engineering degrees is computer science. So I always had a, a joy for computers. And, and for me, and my computer science was half hardware, but a, but a lot of software, but this is way, way back in the days when we like programmed on punch cards and stuff like that when we, when I first started, but I always saw the computer as a tool to make it easier to communicate. So, you know, you can get all this data and put it together and put it in tables and you will, I mean, you, you guys all have probably been through this already, um, where you'll get glossy eyed people looking at you right away because it's overwhelming. So one of the key facets that is important is, is being able to distill a lot of data into something that's easily digestible. And so that's where I saw a lot of the things that we do from a strength and conditioning perspective and a fitness perspective. If I can change that to a picture or, or a single chart, then that's going to be a lot more powerful in getting my information across. So like when I was coaching soccer, um, if I showed the players a chart of their heart rate and I just made sure it was in a nice picture of a graph where they could actually see, oh, the line's going up to the red zone. Now it's coming down to the, to the yellow zone. Um, that's where I felt I could make the biggest um, impact because now the people could see that, or the, the, the athletes can see, oh, we're not just making this up as we go, but there's a reason behind it. So the coding is because there's a lot of tech, there's a lot of technology out there that has software that comes with it, but you're kind of limited to what that software gives you. The coding is what gives you the flexibility to make whatever you want. So that's where I think it's really important. And, and I, I know a lot of us, myself included, started off using Excel and basically throwing stuff in Excel and then using formulas in Excel. And that's all fine until you get to column DX that where your, your spreadsheet's just way too large and now it's unman you're back to unmanageable again. So to me, the coding is, is an important skill because it allows you to stay organized and to have a lot more power than what you're limited with, with say like something like Excel. So yeah, I know, um, I think I guess one thing I didn't mention when I introduced myself is I'm also uh, an adjunct faculty over at UH Clear Lake, University of Houston Clear Lake, where I teach an undergraduate biomechanics class and a graduate biomechanics class. And this is something I really try and impress on the graduates is that, you know, you guys all want to know about how many sets and how many reps and should we do velocity based training and what, what should we do as far as metabolic conditioning. And, and that's all important, but you guys got to be able to distill this down to be able to show something to someone. And you also, you might be getting a job where you, you have a force plate now and you want to, you have to be able to use the force plate. So that's where I think the aspect of understanding the technology and understanding the coding is critical for our people up and coming in this area. I mean, you don't have to be a guru and, you know, have a master's degree in coding, but you should be able to open up like R or something like that and be able to put some simple scripts into it. And I, I taught myself by honestly watching YouTube videos and um, what and doing some self-paced courses on Coursera website. Um, and the reason I got into it, by the way, is it was probably back around 2011, 2012. Um, I was doing a lot of coding in MATLAB and MATLAB costs a couple thousand dollars per year for a license. Plus if you want any libraries to do any extra sort of processing, it costs more money. And I started reading this, this is about the time when they started talking about big data and, um, data scientists. And I kept on reading and seeing, they kept on talking about R and Python. And I just thought, cause I'm just naturally curious, I need to figure out how to use this because I think it can be pretty powerful. And now I turned out, it turns out it has to be. So I know Javar, that's probably a really long winded question or answer to the question. I'll say it in a, two short sentences. Yes, I think it's really important that people up and coming in sports science understand how to code because it gives you the flexibility to create a message and analyze your data that makes you better in whatever you're doing. Yeah, and you know, obviously it's gonna take time for that. It's gonna take, shoot, just, so uh, John brings up a really 
great website, Coursera. So if, if anyone out there doesn't know, uh, C O U R, right? Uh, S E R A. Uh, John actually introduced that to me as well. And it's, 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 it has a lot of information on it. Um, you know, uh, uh, learning courses and things like that. It's really good for the busy strength and conditioning coach uh, that, you know, and John, we're busy. So I think when we're managing this and trying to find balance, um, I guess I would follow up and you kind of answered the question, but how important is data management and what should we as strength coaches be doing uh, obviously we don't know, we might not know how to, to write code. So, uh, what is, what are the, the few things that we should be doing when it comes to data management that, that will, uh, strengthen our, our position in our field? Well, a, a general, maybe this is a philosophical, um, thing that I'll, I'll say is, is maybe think about anticipating what questions you're going to ask of your data later because what I think a big mistake people do when they collect data and remember collecting data is any sort of information because data is information so this could be numbers that are coming out of some piece of equipment like a force plate or an accelerometer or a GPS all the way to a wellness scale that you're asking the players in the morning when they show up to your facility or a um, an RPE afterwards, it's all data. So yeah, I think you have to think about what you're gonna probably wanna ask of that data. Like, are you gonna wanna show trends over time? Are you gonna wanna show just, I just care about what happened today because that can drive how you set your data up. So this is always the way that I've done things both from a coding perspective and a data management perspective is, is never approach it from the front end of I just got to get this data all into one place and then I'll deal with it later. I approach it from the back end of what I'm going to, what am I going to actually use this data for? And then that helps me to figure out what, what's the best way to store this data. So that that's like a philosophical thing um, from a, uh, you know, from a, just a general pragmatic standpoint, you know, I, I don't think that you, that is people working in the strength and conditioning area need to, all of a sudden, well, I can't do be a strength and conditioning coach anymore because I got to go back to school to learn how to program. No, you don't have to do that. But what you can do is maybe, you know, like we talked about, use Coursera or use YouTube or find someone who you might know to say, hey, can you show me how to do, how to, how to start off with this? And then use your own data to learn how to program. Because that's the other thing that I've done also is I'll never unless it's an assignment in a class, I'll never write a program for the sake of writing. It'll always be using data to learn how to program and how to, to learn how to use something better. So, so that would be the other thing is maybe see if you can learn how to do some of these skills a little bit of a time, but use it in a way that's actually helping you versus thinking I've got to learn everything before it's going to help me out. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. So John, just going back, I was thinking from the strength coach's perspective and you kind of answered it, um, taking Coursera classes um, for the strength coach that does want to get more into the, to data and data analytics, because I don't, know if, I don't know if people are thinking when I grow up, I want to be a sports scientist yet. I, don't, I, I know we kind of end up, we, have, we end up there, but it's not something where some people are coming up and they're saying, I want to be a strength coach or I want to be a, a doctor or a trainer or a nutritionist, but sports scientist doesn't, isn't, it's a really cool, awesome job. Right. But it's, it's, it's not really set up for you to kind of start off that way, at least from my perspective. So I guess it's a two part question. Are we, is it possible to start off that way and kind of really know you want to be a sports scientist or you just kind of got it. You have to end up there after being, doing engineering, some computer classes, some data classes, being a coach here, being a sport coach, being a, like, how do you end up there? And if you are currently on this track of being a strength coach, how do you expand to being a sports scientist? So that's a great question because I've gotten, and I'm sure you guys too, because you guys are well-known in the field also have had young people say, hey, how do I get to be where you are? 
And I think, you know, the, the, the first answer that comes to my mind is the, is the answer that I never liked hearing when I was young, which was get old and get experienced. That's how you get to where we are. But we all know that that's true is, is you're always building your foundation. So, so like I, I didn't grow up thinking I want to be a sports scientist. I thought up, I grew up thinking I want to work with people to make them better, hopefully in sports at the time it was soccer but I know I'm really good at math. So I wonder if there's a way to blend those, but I spoke, I focused more on the coaching side. Um, now that was back when I, my formation was in the eighties um, and, and early nineties. So that was when sports science was, you got to have a dedicated laboratory or a university with hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment. So basically you couldn't do the stuff that you would want to do unless you were a university researcher. So I think now, if I was starting over again, um, I would realize that, oh my gosh, some of the things that you could only do 10 years ago with a, a very expensive equipment, you can almost do on your phone now. So I would, I would start thinking about, if I would encourage a younger coach to, you know, you don't just go in one direction or the other, but maybe blend yourself and you could have an emphasis. So, if you, if you really like the strength and conditioning aspect of it, then get good at that. But don't pretend that, well, I don't have to know anything about the science because we all know this is how the world is. I got to know the sports science stuff. And, and that doesn't mean everything is just have an idea of how to do some things. And on the flip side, if you're a sports scientist, there's a lot of people I know, uh, young people I know who are like, they, they'll get like computer science degrees and economics degrees, and they want to get into sports. They're thinking of it from the number side they need to get more boned up in things like take some biomechanics classes, take some exercise physiology classes. So maybe spreading yourself a little bit more. Um, but I do think that in general, doing only one or only the other might kind of limit you a bit. And that's where I would encourage getting, a, getting yourself spread out a little bit in, in all the areas. I mean, okay. and the other thing I'll add, and, and, and I know, for this from experience, I've gotten to where I am today by taking on a lot of opportunities without worrying about what it's going to do for me now. Um, taking them on more from the perspective of, I, I really enjoy doing this and, oh wait, you, you mean I can get paid a little money for that? And, you know, of course you got to pay your bills and all that. So eventually you have, you, you, you want to get to the point where everything's taken care of financially, but I've never really in my life so far have gotten into a situation where I've only made the decision because of the dollars. It was because I really like doing this and I want to do it. And that's just open doors. Um, so that's the other thing that I think is important is, is not driving yourself only based on the title or based on where the position is, but basing it on what kind of experience you can get that you can build on for your next step. Yeah. And Ted, maybe, you know, you, you and John have, have been around uh, our experts in our field for a long time. So like, how has that role of a strength and conditioning coach changed over the years since, you know, you guys first entered, um, you know, the, the field, what's the old school strength coach look like and what's the new school, <laughs> the, the new school strength coach look like? Uh, I would think the, uh, the availability of information to assist with programming is much more readily available now than it was, you know, back in the late seventies. Um, and I think the use of technology uh, is much more prevalent and, and it has a, uh, has a role in assisting in making your profession better. But I think to be a great strength coach never changes in that you have to have great communication skills and coaching skills. Um, the additional information that you have relative to physiology, biomechanics, uh, nutrition, technology, that's great. But if you aren't a great coach at the core, uh, it doesn't matter what you're in, you'll be an average coach if you don't have those great coaching skills. I, I would echo what Ted just said, um, and even just add, add some emphasis to it, uh, 
I started off academically, like I said, engineering, and then went to um, went into biomechanics. But my my whole goal at that time in my life was to be a coach. I wanted to, I wanted to be coaching, so I was learning about how to coach. So I was surrounding myself with really good coaches. And in soccer, I was taking my licenses, and I was tr- striving to to work in the, the, the Olympic development program back in the nineties was the big, was the way that your top players were playing and your top coaches were there. By doing that, it, it's really helped my communication skills because if I would have stayed in the laboratory and learned everything that I know about biomechanics the same way, but didn't go the coaching route, I think I would have a difficult time potentially a expressing that and communicating that to others, but b thinking like a coach and thinking, what does a player or a coach want out of this data? I, I might think it's really excited that I can see these really wavy lines, but why does the coach care? By being having a coaching background, I understand and I know why the coach cares. So it becomes no longer me being excited because I'm able to show some chart of some number and say, look at this number. But instead, it's this number is important because it lets you do something that you want better that's where the coach side comes in. So I, I echo what you said, Ted, that the, the coaching and the communication capability is really, really vital in this space. Yeah. You know, I think with the technology, I, I think from a coaching perspective, it's not necessarily, so the coach has, has had to evolve uh, because of the demand of what the players are asking for, right? They, they want more information about uh, they're, they're more intuitive. They're more uh, uh, into more knowledgeable of, of the science they're reading up. They're trying to maximize their performance. Uh, they have more access, you know, they have better access to educational materials, uh, even simply through social media. So they're bombarded. So it's like, to me, the coach just has to be so prepared. It's not just the authoritarian uh, you know, if I tell you to do this, you're going to do this. The, the, the players are asking questions and you got to be prepared and be, be ready to answer those questions. And I think that's where the data comes in that you can justify what you're talking about. You're just not talking, you know, out of your, your keister. So I think that's, that's the major thing. And, um, and again, what you got, and I'm going to just echo what you guys said helps with communication. Right. So, um, that's great. And yes, I was calling both of you old. Uh, the new school coach is maybe like 22. Pat and I are right in the middle. We're just sitting pretty right in the middle. <laughs> we'll stay there. We'll stay right there. Yeah. yeah. Now, Javar, I think the, the if you're going in any job interview, your point's well taken. You have to explain why you do what you do to the players because it's not like it was 30 years ago. They will go, why? Why are we doing this? And uh, you have to have the knowledge to understand, you know, why you're doing certain programming and communicate it effectively. And I think ultimately understanding the why makes you a better coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. for You know, and what what John helps me out with is is a lot of the force plate data, but the the game changer for me using the force plate was that I could use it in coaching and, and give live feedback. When I was able to give live feedback, it changed the game for me because uh, that was was where it was useful to the player, uh, and they saw the value in it. And now you're giving uh, the players giving better effort because they see uh, and appreciate what you're trying to do for them. So um, anything you can do uh, regarding data that you can uh, in a live or very quickly share the information with the player. I think that's, you know, we talk about purpose and that why is, you know, what we're collecting, what we're trying to do is to service the player. So uh, that's my first priority. It's not what I'm bringing to the front office. It's not what I'm bringing to my boss is what I'm bringing to my players. And then from there, I will communicate that to my bosses, to my front office. Um, so I think that's been uh, the, the, key to success in a, in a lot of ways when it comes to bridging the gap between the, the research and the, the reps. <laughs> yeah. John, where do you think we are um, 
I don't want to say as society, but I guess as, as athletic performance professionals, where are we? And I guess what's what area do we need to go and conquer next so that we we kind of fill this this pie in um, so it's more complete and holistic so that we we accomplish what Javar just talked about, which is servicing the athletes. Where, where is the area that you think a little bit of focus or more focus needs to be applied? Mm. That's an interesting question because the uh, the pie is, a, is much more filled now than it was even like five and six years ago with what kind of information we can get in the turnaround. And like Javar said, being able to, to use measurement tools, not for research, but for actual feedback. Um, that's, that's changed a lot. Um, so, wow. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's, it's where we need to get more people who are involved either with us directly or on the periphery to understand what we're doing, but also understand that it's, it's not because the, the, the hardware or the software exists. It's because of the knowledge that we have that we can bring and translate this information I think we as sports scientists, sports science, sports scientists and sports coaches know that, but I'm wondering how many people who work with us, whether they're in the athletic realm or they're in the management realm, understand also what we're bringing. I don't know, maybe that would be one um, where we where there's some emphasis could be in. Um, I mean, we already talked about getting our sports scientists to our, our I keep on saying sports scientists, but let's let's just say our, our sports professionals. Um, more well-rounded in understanding both physical training, coaching, and being able to use the science. So I, we've already talked about that. I think that's important also. Uh, maybe spreading out the information, though, might might be better. And I, I also really agree with what Jabbar was saying, is getting the players to understand it and, and know what we're doing. Um, and that's where I've always found, you know, I learned that, that on, and it was just to me kind of one of those it makes sense to do sort of things. Um, when I was working – with the Houston Dash, we used to collect wellness um, information. And, and you guys all may have been through this where you start to look at the wellness data and you start to see, okay, I'm not seeing anything different. Do these guys even, are they even thinking about what they're doing or are they just filling out this wellness questionnaire because we've asked them to? That was always the time that I would ask the head coach, hey, okay, can I have 10 minutes with the team? And I would bring them in and show them, here's what I'm doing with your data. Remember how last training was a little bit lighter? It's because when I saw these numbers peak, this told me that the number, the, day, the, the training before maybe wore you down a little bit. And as soon as I would do that, the players would all of a sudden, the numbers would start coming back to where I would expect until it didn't. And then I would have to do that. So it's not one talk, but that's where the education of the player is important to understand that we're not there to just do this because someone told us to, or because we think it's good. We're, we're actually using it for their benefit. Ted, do you have a, from a research perspective, um, you know, have you seen anything uh, that you would say from a, so I, I think what John brings of value is just the multicultural experience. So I probably should have started off and just said that. So um, what do you see as far as, you know, crossing over on a sports, what's the value uh, you know, we have a lot of people that I want to be in basketball. I want to be in baseball. I want to be in football. What's the value? And is there any, maybe is there any research to multicultural uh, education uh, where there's value to crossing over sports or not being afraid to go get other experiences in, in other sports and other environments? Oh, I, I think uh, it, it makes you more valuable because it's the different experiences. Um, I remember when Chip Kelly was at Oregon and he was running, you know, at that time, it was the first, you know, you know, up-tempo and he would go watch basketball practices in the off season to watch fast breaks. And that would help him hit with some of his route combinations. So a lot of coaches will look outside their particular sport to get a different perspective that may improve them with their sport. Um, 
you know, I always remember, uh, you know, like uh, Tony La Russa and Bob Knight would always have a very close relationship. So if you look at um, a lot of the great coaches, they try to find and, and they reach out for other people in other sports. It gives them a different perspective. They want to look at things sometimes from, uh, if you look at things from a different, you know, sport that can, you know, I think help you out. I sat in some baseball meetings and they wanted, how does football look at scouting and prospects? And can, we just would compare notes on that. So I think the experiences, John, is um, the wide variety, I think really enhances his overall value to whatever sport that he's consulting with. And I'm sure you've experienced that too, having been in pro baseball and now pro basketball, that oh. there's some stuff that you would bring from the table from baseball that's yeah. has been you found that that was a valuable experience in your dealing with basketball players. Yeah, I think I certainly. I mean, this I'm a huge, huge supporter of it, and and it pushed it. Um, it, it, it's something that I push on our athletes to get, uh, even if it's, uh, for example, uh, taking basketball players and going and doing a little MMA, how does that, this cross over? Well, you know, big and in, in wrestling in, in the paint, how can you leverage your body, use your body to, uh, I mean, there's just so much value to it. We had, uh, we had the whole entire Seattle Mariners front office a few years ago, sitting in the Houston Rockets war room, just, just talking about uh, what we do from a, a science and evaluation perspective to an organizational perspective, how we run things. And um, I think, you know, more and more people are seeing a value of it, but, it, you know, John, you have had, a, a tr you know, a lot of cool experiences. So I, I, I'm certain you see the value of it. What, what have you gotten out of that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the way Javar and I met, by the way, was me just saying, hey, you have four stacks. Can we come over? I was with the strength and conditioning coaches at NASA. Can we come and take a look at your four stacks? Because we're thinking of buying them. And of course, he said, yeah, that, that, that's great. Come over. So we went went there and took a look at it. And and this is how our, our relationship started. But but I've been personally, I've always lived by the uh, the idea that if, if you don't ask, you don't get. So I, I, I'm always the type that if I'm going to be somewhere or if I wanted to check something out, I have no problem reaching out to them. You know, now, honestly, I know that when I was emailing with a NASA email address, to probably opened some doors that might not have been open, but it doesn't hurt to ask. So, so for instance, I've been at, in the training center of Real Madrid and I've been in the training center of uh, Manchester United. And I've been at, I've been, uh, I spoke in at uh, Aspire Academy in Qatar. And that's all from just reaching out to somebody and saying, hey, I want to come and check, check out what you're doing, whether it was a perspective of, I have a specific question of what you're doing to, you know what, I'm going to be in the area. Can I come and just chat with you a little bit? And, at the, and, and I was always looking at it, and I always still will look at it from the idea of, how is it going to strengthen you as a coach, but also how could you bring something back to wherever you're working and say, Hey, they do it like this over here. Let's try doing it that way also. Um, and then as you guys probably know from your experience, sometimes you do that and it's really good because, because something you learn makes a difference. And sometimes you do that and you bring it back and your people who you're, you're working with now say, no, 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 we're not going to do it. We're going to do it our way. And that's okay because I've still learned a different way or, just a different, another way to look at things. So I think that that area is really, really important of reaching out. And and I always looked at it also, if I send an email or a, maybe a, a, a message through LinkedIn, the worst they're gonna do is not respond to me. That I'm not out, out, not out anything. If I send a message saying, hey, can I meet you? Um, and, uh, and the worst they're gonna do is not respond. The best they're gonna do is I'm going to get into where I want to get into. So I've never had a problem with, with reaching out and doing that because in the end, I, I don't really care if they don't respond. I it's, that's not what my goal is. My goal is to see if I can get someone to say yes, because if I don't ask them, they're not going to say anything. Javar, you made me with that question. You made me uh, go back and like, when did I meet Javar? You uh, spoke at a, 
think it was an NSCA conference. And I think, I don't know if you remember that. Um, somehow we exchanged information, but you were with the Tigers and I'm from Detroit. And I said, while I'm home visiting um, family, I was going to reach out and um, I called you up say, I'm, I'm from Detroit and I'd like to stop by. I don't know. Do you remember that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and I, I remember uh, standing against the, the dugout fence, just, you know, talking to shop a little bit while I, maybe batting practice, something was going on. It was, yeah. it was the first time we we uh, got to hang out a little bit and then and uh, we've learned from each other ever since. So uh, it's right on. I yeah. mean, just I mean, I think all of us, uh, it's that's how it's kind of gone and um, you know, maintaining the relationship and, uh, you know, just, I think the growth mindset, I think we all can share that growth mindset. And I think that's a common thread in strength and conditioning coaches is I think a lot of us share that growth mindset and we have those, those ambitions and just, um, you know, looking to learn and grow. And, and so we have it in us, a lot of us is, is just kind of knowing how to do it the right way. And, uh, John mentioned some really good in this, in this part is is the networking side of it, right? Of just you know the the intercultural, multicultural ex exploration is is simply networking, and all of a sudden you know you have another opportunity elsewhere. So uh, it it can benefit not only, but I think the goal should be it's not self serving. It's how can I serve my players, and if I can reach out to this expert at this location or just but I can bring something back. The gravy is just now you, you maybe establish a relationship with those people there that you, you met or something like, but you're not going into it to try to work your way up. <laughs> you know, you're going into it to learn, to bring something back to those who you currently serve. So I think that servant type leadership approach uh, to, to um, you know, multicultural exploration is, is a key in our field. Yeah, we um, every time we had a conference as a staff, we would plot out stops along the way. And if the conference lasted for two or three days, we would actually start out two or three days ahead of time before the conference and then plot stops along the way. And, uh, you know, that was those those moments in between those stops, you had a chance to talk about those experiences and, and the people that you met and the relationships you were able to form. And then how uh, on the way back from conference, it was always, okay, we received, a, we got a lot of information over the last four or five days. What can we implement? Cause we can't, <laughs> there's a lot of information. We can't go back and do everything. Uh, so that was, that was always important. So meeting people, those relationships and networking, um, looking how you can come back and serve your players. I know, Javar, when I received the Detroit Tigers manual and um, had a conversation with the baseball um, staff at Missouri and said, well, what the Detroit Tigers do is when I visited with the head strength coach, and that carries a lot of weight. Carried a <laughs> lot of weight. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Well, John, uh, any other sort of wisdom, anything you can uh, share with us that uh, you know, you'd like our, our peers to, to know? Um, I guess the only thing I, I, could, I, I maybe could end up with is, if, to me, if you wanna be successful, you gotta be curious. Um, and you got to be willing to take some chances. That's what curious is. It's curious is asking questions and then, and then going and seeing what the answer to those questions are. And some of those questions may never be answered um, because they're, they're bigger questions. But the point is, is that if you sit back and you think you know everything and you're happy with the status quo, I think to me, that's the way to have a problem you take your foot off the gas so by being curious i mean wanting to learn something new so if i'm if i'm working as a strength and conditioning coach and i'm used to programming a certain way questioning is there a better way or this other person does it this way i need to check and see 
is that way maybe a better way than what I'm doing? That's the curiousness that I'm getting at, the professional curiousness, uh, curious for knowledge, curious for uh, expertise. That I think is the secret of wanting to, of moving forward in this, probably in any area of life, but in this area for sure. Um, and then, you know, I'll back that up with the, being curious and learning is not something that you just turn on and turn off on a daily basis. It's something, it's kind of like a lifestyle almost. And sometimes that curiosity, it may feel like you're getting nowhere. And so it's, it's no different than when we're training for something. We, ne we don't usually have straight line gains. We usually gain and we plateau and then we crater a little bit and then we plateau again, but the plateau is higher. It's, that's how we train our body. It's the same thing, I think, when we're training ourselves for these sort of experiences is can't be expecting that if, like, like uh, Pat was talking about that he, he met you at NSCA and had a conversation with you that the, the second that he walked out of Tiger Stadium or wherever he met with you, that all of a sudden it's a game changer. It's just, no, that is something that he had. And when the time was right, he was able to use it. So that's where the curious is. It's, and I think that comes back to what you said about it. It's not doing it for yourself. It's about try, being curious of how do I serve other people better? Um, that to me is the, in the, a really important feature of what we should be having our younger uh, coaches think about as they form themselves for the rest of their career. So, John, uh, before we uh, head out, what, uh, any uh, books you would recommend to any of our uh, listeners out there? So you're thinking like technical books or just any book in general? Any book in general. Um, you know, you'll have to excuse me for a second while I, I look at my Audible because I do a lot of my reading while I'm out walking my dog at night. So there's a couple good ones that I just uh, that I just read, and usually I'll hear these on some podcast, and and I'll say this. Someone says, "Oh, this is a, a good one," so then I say, "Yeah, I should take a look at that one." So um, there's a book called the Orig uh, called Originals by a guy named Adam Grant. I don't know if you guys have heard this or not, but the the concept behind the book is that people who are original or the first ones to do things typically have a certain mindset. And they typically have the same sort of fallbacks or same sort of problems. So it's like a reassuring type book, but it's, it's one of those like a self, like a, a, a self-development type book. So, so I thought that was good. Um, uh, you know, there's another one that I think would be, that's a good one that I, I really enjoyed. And my friend, uh, Mike Robosca, who works with Toronto SC, uh, talked or told me about this one. It's called Spark. I don't know if you guys have heard of Spark before. But Spark is, is a book written by a guy named uh, John Rayley, I think his name is. Uh, John, no, John Rady, I'm sorry. And basically, it's called Spark, The Revolutionary New Science of Exercise and the Brain. And the concept behind it is how exercise not only put, creates better, um, a better body, but it also affects our mind. And in, in, a, in, a, in a really short nutshell, um, the, the, the start of the book talks about how there was this guy, a, prof a teacher in a Chicago high school who's a physical education teacher, and he started having students run with heart rate monitors. This was back like in the 90s or something like that. And his whole point was to get them more fit because he felt like there was a, a lack of fitness in the schools. Well, anecdotally, they started noticing that the people who did this running, and he typically did it before school, um, they started to do better in their first and second period classes than their peers. And so the whole book is about the science that's now been done that talks about how exercise actually increases the productivity of the brain. So that's a good one because I think that might be a, a good one for the people who are really into the exercise side, but not sure about the science one that kind of links them both. Um, and I know the reason my buddy at, at, um, at Toronto FC told me about it is, they use that. So like when they, they're really into mindfulness there. So uh, what he had told me, at least they were doing this in the last, uh, last couple of years, they were, they were practicing mindfulness with the players in terms of being able to, to just get in touch with their body. But before they do that, they would spike their heart rates. So get them on a cycle or on a treadmill and get them running really fast or secondly fast to, 
to peak their heart rate up at me at some number. I don't know what it was, but like, I'm just going to throw a number, 80 or 90% of their max heart rate. And then they would take them off the bike and then they would let them recover, but then they would do their mindfulness, their mindfulness activities. And this came from this book because the book was showing about how this is something that actually could be beneficial. So I think that's a good one that might be a, that your listeners might like to read and get into. That's awesome. great. Yeah. Well, any, any questions for us, John? No, I think uh, everything, this has been a great experience. Um, and wow, I mean, I'm, it's for me, it's an honor to have three such distinguished people uh, having me on the, on the podcast because you guys, their reputation speak for themselves. So thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate you having me on. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Anything else? I know, Javar, you always got a last word, last question. Or something. Uh, I, I'm just impressed that he can walk and read at the same time because uh i i'm i'm walking these skyways now in minneapolis and i put my head down one time to just look at a text and i'm lost i'm completely no. lost so the bar i said audible it's it's my reading is my, oh okay my, i is, yeah, i yeah. no see? i can't walk and read either if i get too much <laughs> good okay <laughs> I was like, wow this is yeah. pretty good it's a new I level of sports science there Jamar. <laughs> get, get on this level <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. They're, the technology is better. I, I should probably check into Audible versus paperback, huh? <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you all. Thank you so much, John, Javar, Ted. It's been a pleasure um, once again getting the band back together and having an awesome conversation. Um, research to reps roundtable, looking at the science and the research and the practical application, I think what's been awesome and beautiful about this show is just understanding that no matter how sciencey, how nerdy, how data driven you, you, you are, is the power of relationships still come through, uh, you know, um, very, very, very bright. So I just want to thank you all. Appreciate your friendship. Um, John, it was very, it was awesome getting to uh, spend some time with you and uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this show up. Thank you all. This is the Research to Reps Roundtable. And until the next show, take care.